That red light means it's on? Yes. The red light on the camera? Yes, we are recording. Should I start? Before I was ever born, I wanted to, in, to, to explain why it was I ended up in France. My mother was born in Germany, my maternal grandmother. Anytime I say grandmother, grandfather, it's always maternal because my paternal grandparents were murdered early on. Um, when my mother was 11 years old, that means 1927, she came home from school crying and asked her father, why did we Jews kill Christ? And his reaction was to say, I'm not going to stay in this country. And he yanked up his wife, who came from a family that had been there for at least 100 years, and his four children, the youngest in a stroller, and went to France. He figured he was a master mechanic. He could get a job anywhere. Made a mistake. Uh, they ended up quite impoverished. And um, fast forward, I was born in Nancy, which is in the northeast part of France. When I was two and a half, I contracted diphtheria. After three months in isolation, I remember none of it. But I can only begin to imagine if you're in isolation, you're all by yourself, any nurse or doctor who comes in must be wearing a mask. It had to be terrifying. Um, I was released from the hospital. I survived diphtheria, which not everybody did. And I think it's my mother who made the decision that I would not survive wartime city living. No, even, yeah, it was wartime. Wartime city living with the food rations that went on. So she put me on a farm called, in, a, in a village called Fougere, in the middle of nowhere. There was nothing around, not a store, nothing. No, the church and the schools. Um, and so what I do remember, I must have been around three, I remember a day when I stood there feeling, I'm healthy. I'm sure I didn't use that word, but um, I felt physically better. And I was left there an extra four years, very much alone, very isolated, and very, very sad. I cried all the time. I had no friends, because who wants to be friends with someone who cries? Um, <clears throat> the family kept me because they were being paid. I like to think that I was a hidden child who didn't know she was being hidden by people who didn't know they were hiding her. I'm sure if they had known I was a Jew, they would not have taken me in. I didn't know I was a Jew. At two and a half, you don't know your religion to begin with. I went to a one-room schoolhouse for the girls, and the sweetest nun taught me to read and write, and she was the only person who ever smiled at me all those years, including my mother. My mother came to visit me one day a year. Um, at lunchtime, I would sit on the, on the hill, leaning against the wall of the, of the schoolhouse, overlooking the boys' school. There were very few girls going to school. I guess once they learned to read and write, they were kept home to do the, the housework. But the school, the boys' school was much bigger. Uh, lunch, my lunchtime was their recess time. And um, so the two men teachers would stand with their hands behind their back talking to each other, and I could see their lips moving. And the boys would be running, running all over the place. The, the courtyard was beaten earth with some wonderful old oak trees. And at the base of the trees were some stones to protect the trees from these running boys. They all ran except for one boy who was walking shoulder to shoulder with his sister. Imagine being a girl in a boy's school. And they never stood still. They kept on walking and looking behind them constantly because every so often, a boy would run to the base of, the tr of a tree, take a stone, and throw it at them. And those teachers' lips never stopped moving. 
it was okay. What was these two children's sin? They were Protestant instead of Catholic. So as, as young as I was, it didn't feel right to me. So I didn't fit in, not only because I was always crying, but because things just weren't, I didn't agree with things. Like watching a chicken run around the courtyard with its head cut off. You know, they say running like a chicken without a head. That's because that's what they do until finally the chicken plops down. Uh, the children came around and looked and cheered and thought it was such fun. And I saw it once. I never came back to see it twice. I just didn't fit in on every possible level. Um, the one place I felt secure was in the church. It was a beautiful, small, gothic stone church, and the sun coming through the stained glass windows just warmed my heart. It, it was a beautiful, beautiful place, and the Gregorian chants contributed to the beauty, but otherwise, nothing. I had one friend, and that was my handkerchief. I had a man's handkerchief that I sucked every night instead of sucking my thumb. I reached either five or six years of age, and the farmer's wife, Madame Riou, came to me and said, you're getting too old to suck a handkerchief. She bribed me to give it up. Um, she said, I will give you some coins. Wow, there were no stone, uh, stores around, but I knew money had some kind of value. The first night, I didn't sleep at all. The second night, half the night I didn't sleep, and then I finally passed out from exhaustion, and she gave me those two coins. I remember my little hand and the two coins in it. It was my right hand. And um, oh, it, was, it was the first time that I had any positive feelings. And she said, but let's put it away for safekeeping. Let, here's an egg cup. We'll put it into the egg cup and keep the egg cup way up there. They, they had a beautiful carved oak cabinet. In the, the kitchen was the living room, was everything. I said, sure. They had three children. The oldest was a woman who already had a baby and brought the baby in the dark carriage. The second one was a very good looking uh, young man. And the third one was a boy who didn't go to school because he had some kind of mental problem. He, at this point, he was about 16. And out of the blue, he approached me and he said, you think you got paid to give up your hanky, huh? I said, yes. He said, oh, really? He reached up and he took down the egg cup and it was empty. I was shattered and it influenced me for life. You know, how do you trust anybody? I do trust people, but it took a long time. It was devastating. So why did I suck a handkerchief and not my thumb? Because when I was a baby in my mother's arms, there were uh, shelter drills and you had to run down to some basement. And the leader of, of one group said, please keep some kind of metal container near your front door so that on your way out, you can grab it and bring it with you. Because should you be locked in by rubble for several days, what will get you will not be hunger, but it will be thirst. So since urine is sterile, you use that metal container and you collect your urine and you drink that so you don't feel thirst that badly. So my mother, forever a survivor, figured, how do I get this baby to suck her own diaper? She put a man's handkerchief into my mouth and that was how I became uh, close to the handkerchief. Back to the farm. Um, the day before I think it's the day before the new year. It's called Les Etrennes. 
is when children are given little gifts. Monsieur Ryu, the, the, the farmer himself, called me in and called two other girls, and I didn't know them, and told us to stand behind the metal door leading to the staircase to the bedrooms upstairs. Wow, what's this about? And I stood there and I needed to go to the bathroom. There's no way I was going to do anything to jeopardize this incredible whatever experience it was going to be. And I giggled. I remember giggling. I didn't know what giggling was. That, that, it was that exciting. He finally called the three of us out. And he handed the first girl a cheap doll. I could tell it was cheap stuff, but he handed this to her. He handed the next, another doll to the next one. And then he said to me, for you, nothing. Why did he call me in? I don't know to this day, but it was, it was such a mean thing to do, just like the younger son. The older son was found dead in a ditch with his fingernails pulled out. And that's a form of torture. They didn't tell me this. I overheard it. I, I don't know. It was such a, a hole in nowhere. Why would anyone want to torture anybody there? The only thing I can think of is that it wasn't far from the city, La Mastre, where my mother was given a book that, in, in, in French, you gave a book with a dédicace, which means you said to so-and-so, and the date and the location, and the, and the person's name, the person giving it. Um, so she probably was working in the underground, in the resistance, in that area. And so if La Mastre had an underground cell, it's very likely that this young man might have known about it or might have been suspected of knowing about it. That's the only explanation I've been able to come up with. What did you remember about German or Nazi presence in your area? None. The closest I can come to is I used to often sit on a on an empty lot with a bombed out house. I have no idea how the house got bombed. And one day somebody came and rounded up the children, not, not near that house, and said, if a plane flies overhead, a plane flew overhead every, I don't know, two weeks, not very often. If a, fl a plane flies overhead, maybe they're going to drop a bomb, although Truly, I don't know why they'd waste a bomb on this little nothing place. You have to go hide. Where did they teach us to go hide? At the base of a haystack, of haystacks. <laughs> They'll blow up immediately, but that's all I can tell you about contacts with Nazis. I was totally unaware of dates, time, war, um, if, current events. I knew nothing. The one thing I knew was that there was a shortage of milk and eggs and, and, and those products, and the Ryu family was making a bundle, selling them all on the black market. I once saw them diluting the milk uh, with water as they put it into a bottle, and I never was allowed to see anything like that again. What, did, what do you remember your mother telling you about that time um, in terms of Nazi occupation? Okay. She, over the years, way after the farm, over the years she told me many stories, one incredibly gruesome, and I don't know whether I should put it on tape or not. Yeah, let me. Um, in her activities with the, the resistance, she always worked with or for some man. She was the secretary. Uh, I, I must in interject. Uh, one time they were in a cave with water flowing on either side and rats crossing her feet constantly. And she was typing whatever he wanted her to do. And the topic of Jews came up. 
And um, he, she said, oh, have you ever seen a Jew? It was a secret that she was, right? It's a foregone conclusion. If you were a Jew, you weren't going to tell the world. Um, or at least not in my family. Um, have you ever seen one? No, he said, but I sure would spot them right away with those horns coming out of their heads. And she laughed inside. That's the, the humor of it. Anyway, one day, it seems that some German was killed and they wanted to get revenge for it. So my mother and the other person were forewarned to quickly drive to this town to try to forewarn the people that they were in danger. They didn't make it in time. It was deserted and the, the, the big oak doors were sealed shut from the outside, the big oak doors of the church. There, every town had a church in the middle and there was smoke coming out the top. They opened the door and my mother said she didn't think it was humanly possible to crawl up a stone wall like that, but there were charred bodies charred onto the walls. They, they were all being punished for having been in a village where maybe somebody went out and killed this one German. Then they walked to the back of the church and there had obviously been a pregnant woman who had not come in with the rest of the people. She was tied to a wooden table and sawed in half through the belly, through the baby with blood all over. That's the most gruesome story my mother told me, but I know it wasn't the only one. She just was very reluctant to share her stories. There were, however, optimistic stories. Um, it seems she was in a train with false papers about to deliver some kind of information. The French trains had benches on e long benches on either side. It was cold weather and it was raining. And in those days, all the coats were wool. So there's a special wet wool smell. And in the middle of a field, the train stopped and on came a, uh, an SS officer with the shiny black boots, and he started walking from one end to the other and stopped at everybody to examine the papers. My mother's thoughts were, are they going to shoot me here? No, they'll probably take me out into the field to shoot me for having such poor quality false papers. He took, he checked this person, he checked that person, and he went on. He didn't see her. He didn't check her. And of course, she, she said a little silent prayer, but it, she used to tell that story often. And one day I thought of asking her, what happened after that? She said, as crowded as it was and as wet as those smelly coats were, everybody on either side of her scooched away because they figured he, know, he knew her. She was one of them. So that was a positive, if, if not sad, story. Um, one time, the family was living in an apartment building in Voiron, which is a, a, a town near the Alps. And word came that the Germans were coming. So my grandfather took all his Hebrew books, and my mother took her typewriter, and they piled them all up um, in a corner waiting for dark so that my father could go down, my grandfather could go down and bury them all. Uh, the apartment buildings were, you know, square, and in the middle of them were, was always uh, some kind of uh, garden. Came a banging on the door. Well, your heart freezes when that happens. And my grandfather opened the door, and it was the upstairs neighbor who was shaking and ghostly white and said, well, what did they say? What did who say? Come on, this is no time for joking. What did they say? He didn't know what, the, what she was talking about. Turns out the Germans had arrived, had gone door to door to door, and had not seen their door. 
So uh, those two uh, little miracles are notable in, in, in my mother's stories. What was her, uh, uh, I understand she was in a way helping a part of what's called the French resistance. Can you talk about her role in sort of resisting or I, in the French resistance? I don't know. Uh, I know she, she, she typed up papers uh, and she delivered papers somewhere, but I don't know anything else about it. She, she did not share it. And my mother died suddenly and un unexpectedly, not sick, and so I never had a chance to think of the questions to ask her. Yeah. Do you know how you were protected or hidden uh, during parts of the war? I was left on that farm. Yeah. They were happy to have me stay there because they got cash for it. I was taken away by my family the day before my first communion. I studied catechism, which was memorizing question number one, answer number one, but question number 11 could have answer number one, too. It didn't make any sense to me, but I, I studied <laughs> religiously um, to be able to pass the test. But my grandfather, who was a master mechanic, always had a car. So he drove my mother and my younger uncle, and the day before my first communion, they came to fetch me. I guess they knew that was the day because probably they got a letter telling them they should bring me a dress for the communion. I have no idea why they showed up then. I did figure out as an adult that they didn't want me to have a first communion since I was Jewish. So it took many months for my mother to have the courage to tell me I was Jewish. Um, that she told me about. I don't remember it. It was really traumatic. Uh, we, were walk in we were in Marseille, which is a port city, and they have a red light district, and on the edge of the red light district was a, a shop with pretty lingerie, and my mother stopped to look. I was walking with her, and I said, oh, we can't look at that. The devil will get us. That's when she realized she had to listen to what her father said, which was, tell this child what her religion is. So at home, she put me on her knee. Very unusual. My mother did not put me on her knee normally. And she said, you know, we don't believe in the devil because we are Jews. And she said, I was so shocked that I didn't even cry, since I cried a lot. And then I brightened up, and I said, oh, no, we can't be Jews. We don't have horns. So. Um, she taught me to say my prayers in, in part Hebrew, part German. And because I was used to praying either like this or like this, she said, we Jews pray like this. It took a long time before I understood there is no hand, hand position to pray in the Jewish religion. But this way, I wasn't going to hold them the Catholic way. What do you remember terms of um, uh, you were hidden away on this farm. Um, but I didn't know I was being yes, hit. Right. And they didn't yes. know they were hiding me, okay? Yes. I was being I was being neglected, yes. but not hidden. I got, I never got a hug, never. And I'm a touchy-feely person. It was so isolating. And this um, compounded your sadness, you know? You bet, you bet. And, and crying all the time doesn't make it that much better. There was a green, lush hill that the children of the era used to love to roll down. And it was great fun. You could see they enjoyed it. I stood at the top of that hill, wanting to roll down. Couldn't. It took me years and years as an adult to figure out how come. Because I knew somewhere within me it wasn't conscious that if I rolled down and hurt myself, nobody would come to my aid. That's how isolated I was. I've seen films of children in different awful situations during the war. They either had a parent, a family member, or other children around them who were in the same boat. I was entirely alone. When 
What do you remember about liberation or when France was... Nothing. When, when, this, when this phase ended? Nothing. I, I, all I know is when I was taken away yeah. in the car. By whom? And my, by my grandfather driving, my young uncle and my mother came to fetch me. Uh, and my, my uncle, who was a sweet, sweet person, um, gave me a stick of gum. I didn't know what gum was, and my mother said, no, you don't swallow it, you just chew it. I chewed it a few times. You know how delicious gum is at the beginning? And bloop, it went right down. Well, did I get a bawling out from my mother, not from my uncle. Um, but I, I knew nothing of the politics or the events that were going on. And once I was in Marseille, I also didn't know. Um, the windows were open, it was warm weather, and I heard this popular song wafting through. That's all. And, and American soldiers would come in their uh, khaki trucks, and they would give out chocolate, and chewing gum, and, and other goodies. But I knew nothing concrete. I was placed in a school, in the public school, which was a terrible experience. Um, from this sweet nun who was kind to me, I was now subjected to a teacher who was vicious. She saw me coming. She wanted everything recited by heart, but that's the French educational system. I, I always had trouble memorizing. I don't remember names or numbers to this day. I have a problem with it. So she would whap me on the calves because I didn't say it right. And it had to be verbatim. You couldn't say the equivalent. Once in a while, she'd punish me a little more by having me stand under the bell at recess. The bell was this big thing. And I didn't care that, that I couldn't run around and play because I didn't run around and play. But the only other people who had to stand there were boys who had beaten up some other boy. And as naive as I was, I thought, they might punch me out. I was transparent to them, but I didn't understand that. So she was mean, mean, mean. I do believe there's an afterlife. So if I ever see her then, I will suggest that she come back and try again. But I knew nothing. I knew it, what we studied was Louis the Fourteenth or history, geography. We we in school we didn't learn anything about the current events. And the it's radio. It's also isolating. It's also right. isolating. You right. had no context of understanding what was going on, why it was going on. You right. were just alone. I was just alone, and frankly, I didn't care about about outside events because. They didn't affect my little bitty tiny world. After the war, when did you come to the United States and why? October of 1946. So the, the French radio, you understand, no telephone, no television. This, this is an era that's completely different from what we have now. The, the radio would play two hours in the morning, two hours at lunch, and two hours in the evening. And my mother loved to tell the story that she was sitting there knitting in the evening after work. My mother always got work because she was perfectly trilingual, although nobody cared about her German. But her English was perfect and her French was perfect. Her French was really elegant. Um, so she's knitting and an announcement comes on the radio that a new organization is being formed called the United Nations and they need bilingual typists. She said she dropped her knitting, went to get her typewriter, and wrote a letter of application. They contacted her. She was tested. She passed the test. And um, they knew she had a child. And so we were going to America. Um, the day that she and I were leaving, at 1 o'clock, a telegram came that said, Basically, we no longer want you because you have a child and we don't want to have the extra expense. Because by then, they obviously had had more applicants than they thought they were going to have. And my I visualized my mother standing there with the telegram. She had beautiful hands. The telegram between these two fingers saying to her father, 
This did not come until after we left. And we took the train to Paris, a very long ride. And we walked into this room that had carpeting. What, what is this stuff? Soft stuff underfoot? I've never seen carpeting. Anyway, I sat on a bench in the back of the room. And my mother proceeded to the beautiful desk in, way up in the front with a princess telephone. And the man said in French, what are you doing here? She said, what are you talking about? And he told her why. And so here I am sitting in the back hearing and understanding all this French. And I, I wanted to totally disappear. Uh, it was, you know, it was my fault. There was an issue. So my mother said, you can't do this to me. I'm not leaving. I, I, I no longer have a job. I have no place to live. You have to let me go. So he picked up the phone and then it switched to English. So I don't know what he said, but we ended up on a propeller plane that had to refuel in Greenland. And we landed at what was called Idlewild. We were picked up by a chauffeur in a wonderful navy blue uniform with a cap with a shiny visor, you know, shiny front. Um, and he took our cardboard suitcase and cardboard box tied with rope and put them into this gigantic trunk that was empty. Must have been a Lincoln Continental or something. I was wearing all the clothes I owned, which wasn't that much, you understand. But it was really uncomfortable, and that's because my mother was afraid that if she packed any extra clothes, she might be charged for the extra weight. So we were brought to the Taft Hotel and um, my grandfather had acquired $50 on the black market. That was a lot of money in 1946, but my mother had no idea what it was worth. Because in those days, to buy a loaf of bread, you had to pay a few thousand francs. Um, so we were both tired and hungry. She figured, I can always order tea. I'm sure $50 should cover tea. She picked up the phone and ordered tea, with a British accent, by the way. She didn't lose her British accent for many years. Um, and along came a bellhop with a little red cap and gold buttons on his red jacket, pushing a cart. Yes, there was tea, but there were crackers and cookies and, oh, maple syrup, because the poor Americans couldn't have sugar. They had to settle for maple syrup. <laughs> that was a comical touch, because we didn't have either. Um, and my mother said, but I ordered tea. He said, well, there's your tea, ma'am. And he stormed out. So we ate every little crumb, took a little nap, and went downstairs. And the hotel was next to a brass rail restaurant with a big brass rail in front of the window. And mid-October, October 20th, I think, uh, they had already set up for Thanksgiving, and there was a turkey with all the trimmings. And I asked my mother, in French, of course, what is that, a chicken? She said, of course not. There are no chickens that big. And besides, it's not a real bird. It's made of cardboard to let you know this is a, a restaurant. Standing nearby was a man in his trench coat. In, in those days, gentlemen wore hats, just as ladies wore hats. He approached, tipped his hat, and said, in French, in Canadian French, he explained he came from uh, Canada, uh, and he said, I must tell you, that is a real bird. It's called a turkey, and if you wanted to, you could go in and have a slice cut and eat it. Wow, wow. So then he said to my mother, how long have you been in this country? She looked at her watch and she said, three hours. He said, would you allow me to treat you to a typical American dish? She said, okay. We went across the street to a drugstore. In those days, drugstores had soda fountains and this one had two little booths. We sat in this booth. He ordered apple pie a la mode. When it came, he paid the waitress, tipped his hat at us and wished us luck. It's one of the sweetest stories. 
your, your taste of your freedom. <laughs> no, the taste of somebody being kind. Yeah, and that too. I had very few of those. Yeah. And it was, then it was Sunday. We stayed in the hotel a few days. It was Sunday, and so some man had bought his New York Times and was carrying it under his arm. Well, in France at that time, a newspaper was one big piece folded in half and folded in half again. So my mother figured this was a newspaper seller. So she asked to buy him a, to, to buy a paper. He said, get your own lady. <laughs> she told this story. When did, you, um, when did you come more to terms with your own Judaism and deciding to come to the Holocaust Center and share your story with students and others? Um, talk about that trajectory a little bit about well, Judaism... It's really a, a very interesting part of the story is that you're sort of hidden Judaism. And, um, and how has that changed through the years up until now? And, um, and what made you begin to want to speak about your experience uh, during World War II, uh, both as a... As a child. Protestant, or just a false Catholic, 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 rather. Protestant, um, you got stoned. Right, uh, um. Well, my mother was hell bent on sending me to Hebrew school. It was a secret where I was going two afternoons, I think it was, a week. She gave me the money for the bus. First, it was five cents a ride, then it was seven cents a ride. And I loved Hebrew school, except for history. I learned Hebrew. Loved it, all, all except for the, the history part. But it had to be a secret, so I couldn't go to services on a Saturday. I didn't start attending services until I was married with child. No, 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 wait a minute, no, no. I did attend for the high holiday services. Sorry, take that back. I was one of those once a year Jews. Um, and so I had no inkling of what, how rich it could be my father died. You notice I didn't mention my father so far. My, my mother left him when I was a baby, thank goodness. And um, the divorce decree it had me spending one month out of two with him every two years when my mother's job brought the two of us back to France. The nightmares would start in March before the summer. He was definitely not enjoyable to be with, as an understatement. So it was always a secret that we were Jewish, that she and I were Jewish, because she said in those days that the UN is full of anti-Semites. People, family members, distant family members would say, what are you talking about? It's a wonderful organization. She had already picked up on the fact that, what, 30 years later, it would be well established that yes, they were full, it was full of anti-Semites, so she didn't want anybody to know she was a Jew. That meant that I couldn't come out as a Jew because somebody would know it. We lived in Parkway Village, which was subsidized by, by, by the UN. I didn't live in Parkway Village for a year and a half. For a year and a half, I lived with Aunt Polly and Uncle Nathan. Uncle Nathan was my grandfather's brother. My grandfather wrote to him and said, you have to keep my, take in my granddaughter because my daughter will have an irregular work schedule on call 24 hours a day. So I learned English in a section of Brooklyn. That's how they talked. Uh, my mother would come to see me once every several weeks, come to get me, and we'd take a, a train ride to where she had a furnished room in Jamaica. So I had practiced this. The, the doors opened, and I knew it would be quiet for a moment, and I looked up at her and I said, you gotta go to work. And my mother, who spoke the king's English, did not compliment me for having learned English. Uh, so my Jewishness was a secret. Uh, we did uh, We did celebrate little things. When my mother was assigned to Paris, and I lived for almost a full year with my grandparents, that was wonderful. And at Hanukkah, we sang, the three of us, my grandparents and I, and it was so beautiful. I went to Hebrew school there and leave it up to the French educators to make 
Hebrew school dull and, and difficult. And I was introduced to the leader of the little girls group. She shook my hand with a fish limp and she asked for my name, gave me her name. And the next question was very typical. What does your father do? That's how French society was run. So when my father died, I was then in my 40s. I sat sure before him because I felt his soul needed all the help it could get. And so once a week, I decided to go to services on a Saturday morning. When my mother died, I said, I said Kaddish for her morning and night every day, but this is my father. And that's when I got used to going to services. I was very out of place, I felt very out of place, but little by little I learned the melodies, I learned the prayers, and I enjoyed it. And that's when I became a much more observant Jew. I love going. What do you think students that, who come to the, our Holocaust Center and take away from your experience during the war and after the war? If I could become a functioning adult, anybody can. I will say that my experiences definitely made me much more open to being uh, empathetic and teaching ESL. At first, I was teaching French, lost my job because there, there was a city fiscal crisis. Anyway, I was recertified in ESL. I have three licenses. I also took the Spanish exam years after that. Um, my, so many of my students were here against their will and I could understand their unhappiness, and they knew I cared about them. So that it was a plus to have suffered. Oh, I wore a steel brace for seven years. My back was deformed. I had scoliosis and lordosis. And the lord, scoliosis means your spine is in an S shape. Lordosis means it, it protrudes. It sticks out. And it made my belly protrude. And I have pictures of me as a little girl with my dress, the dress line goes up over here. My mother used to slap me so I could pull my belly in. The slap didn't help, I couldn't pull my belly in. When it came out that I, I had this need for a steel brace, she felt, obviously felt terrible about it. And we would go to this very kind old man who made the braces as I grew, he had to make a new one. And she would take me, to, it was in Manhattan, and she would take me to Germantown and treat me to a pastry called the Schillerlocke. Just, it had to be because she felt guilty for having smacked me instead of understood that I was deformed. Yeah, so all these experiences, I'll tell, I would tell any, any, anybody, well, certainly not older people, it's too late, but I would tell these students, Give yourself a chance. Pay attention to what you really feel and, and accept whatever is happening and choose to see the positive. I've had some pretty rough things happen to me in my life. I have always seen the positive to it and it's made me more able to, to enjoy the good things, for one thing. You know, you can't be, you can't feel happiness if you haven't felt unhappiness, so... I think your empathy is almost like a shield. No. Uh, no, it's not a shield, because it makes me vulnerable. There was a... In Newtown High School, there was a blonde, pimply teenage boy from South America who did his best to disrupt the class. He didn't want to be there. And so one day I took him out into the hallway, and the conversation was in Spanish. I said, what's going on here? And by the way, he didn't disrupt because he was, I seated him all the way in the back. So he told me his story, which was when he was four or five, his mother decided she wanted to go to New York to make the money to have a better life. And in the meantime, she placed him with her mother and he and the grandmother were very, very good together. And now he's a teenager. All those years he's been left with her. And 
he didn't know his mother, she didn't know him. Mommy married somebody and they had a baby and she decided this is now the time to send for her teenage son. Grandmother did not have a telephone, so he couldn't talk to her. He missed her terribly, she missed him. And the new husband felt it was his God-given duty to discipline this teenage boy. He's telling me all this and it struck chords within me and I started to cry. He was dumbstruck, huh? He made the teacher cry. I didn't have any shields on. We went back into the classroom and um, he came back another two days after that, he disappeared. He couldn't try to be disruptive in a classroom where he made the teacher cry. But I, I couldn't help it. I identified with his pain. So I had a lot of students with pain. Well, I think it's like, other than, uh, you're right, your empathy was vulnerable, but it's also, I think, strength. It's, um, there's, a, there's a consistent and all, throughout the story, your, your empathy is almost, yes, it made you more vulnerable, but I, I also see it as like the core of you as strong. And the reason I became able, strong. And then the, this is the reason you've been able to persevere so well. And this uh, ability, ability for people to empathize or feel others' pain, um, are you seeing, uh, compared to say World War II era, with things going on today and politically, are you seeing parallels? Are you seeing the need for more empathy as a way out? Or how? what would you prescribe for someone who's um, looking to prevent uh, more mass atrocity from happening again? Well, those are two separate questions. Let me answer the first one. What I recommend is embarrassingly simple, and I follow it myself. I don't read the newspaper. I do listen to CBS radio every morning, so I have an idea of what's going on. I, there are people who are really obsessed with the latest news. I'm not. It comes down to greed, power, and viciousness. Every year, for years and years. So. I'm not up with the very latest in general. As for how to prevent hatred, I think this center does a good job of presenting uh, viciousness and how destructive it is. And it's a huge challenge because, for example, my students here, so I was teaching in continuing ed, these were adults. I was teaching ESL. Um, the majority of them didn't know about World War II in Europe. Then again, I didn't know about what their hell was in, in their countries. So um, when they, they didn't know the term Holocaust, class after class, they didn't know Nazi. They didn't know that word. They did know the name Hitler. So th they were far removed from it. So if they come here and they're educated here to understand how destructive it is to hate, this place is doing a great job. With your help, of course, with your help. Um, you mentioned that you had some pictures that you might want to show us. Well, they're, they're, they're little and they're black and white. No, they're over there. Uh, Do you need your glasses? N no, no, not for the pictures. Thank you. Okay, you may or may not want to get a close-up. This is Madame Rioux and me, uh. and that's the farm. And it gives a, the, the, the thing is, it gives a wonderful impression of vast, vast space. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a picture of me, a formal portrait. My mother came once a year, except the year she was in an accident. And one year she showed up and said, we have to go to this neighboring place where there's a hotel to have my formal picture taken. I remember the fury. Usually I had no emotions. 
I was this nothingness. But such fury, the few hours I had with her, and she wasn't warm, and she wasn't loving, and she wasn't tender, but she was my mother. We were going to this hotel to have my formal portrait. I was ordered to smile. This is as close to smiling as I could come. And my hands are fists. The shoes, these were dress shoes, farmer dress shoes. And this picture, as small as it is, my, my aunt, who was a dressmaker, made this dress, very pretty little dress. The only reason I brought it was because you see the bottom line, the hemline goes up because the belly stuck out. So I'm sorry, but my, my information is without specific names and without specific dates. So any advice I can give students is a little bit on the nebulous side. Yes, but there's still a lot to be learned from your story, you know? And Good. I just think that, uh, you know, you could have so easily been filled with anger yes. and that you rejected through empathy. And we, uh, I have colleagues in the English department who, who actually teach uh, uh, empathy in various pieces of literature. And I would think that your testimony uh, would fit really nicely into that um, <laughs> thematically. You just, uh, um, it's, in a way, it's an antidote, I think, to a lot of the viciousness that you described. Okay, and to, to the viciousness we have today in the United States. Correct. And all these people, I, and, I contribute to the Anti-Defamation League. So I was once invi invited to uh, a meeting. And it was about their activities, and in, in particular, hate groups in the South. And the film we saw was of a, a neo-Nazi meeting in someone's basement. with flags and posters all over the place. And there was a crib there with an adorable baby who was nine, 10 months old. And this man spouting all this hatred was kuchi cooing his son. And you knew he was teaching him all the vile thoughts that, that he shared with his fellow neo-Nazis. That made me cry. It was. It was so sad, because the child has no choice. Ah, uh, maybe later on he'll think for himself, maybe. Thinking back to your story, though, the opposite of that was, I think when you saw that chicken die, there was that, I'm wondering whether that was taught or innate. Can, can empathy, is empathy just for those who, where it's inside of them, or can empathy be taught, do you think? It came from within me. It certainly didn't come from outside. When they killed a pig, which they did periodically, I, I did not want to go to the killing, and I ran as far upstairs with as many pillows over my ears as I could gather, because pills, pigs are smart. They know they're being killed, because they know whatever, and the squealing, oh, the squealing was so awful. And the other children thought it was great fun. They had a dog named Fidel. I think it was a, a rusty terrier, what do you call it? Beautiful, beautiful dog who was sick. And Monsieur Riou, the farmer, had determined he had to be put out of his misery. We all walked together to a spot in one of the garden areas. And this Fidel, stood still, parted his two front legs, lowered his head so it would be easier for the farmer to hit him in the forehead. I ran at that point. I ran away. But I heard the shot. How did this dog give himself like that? I don't know, but Fidel, Fidel was a beautiful creature, even in death. So... In our last couple of minutes, uh, is 
there anything else that you wanted to share or uh, reflect on um, before we finish? I would like to stress that, at least from my perspective, everything negative has a flip side. When I lost my job, I was teaching French and a few things out of license because there weren't enough French classes to go around. And I lost my job due to a layoff because the city had this fiscal crisis. I remember sitting on the floor in my home, crying my heart out. They said, they loved me and I loved them. Uh, I was unemployed. It was terrible. My, I, I've had two husbands. My first marriage was already in trouble. Uh, my, my husband, who was very bright, couldn't keep a job. And that created all sorts of things. Um, it was terrible, terrible, terrible. The end of the world. I was basically the one who had a job on a regular basis. And we had two children by then. Um, I learned that it could be even better than teaching French in Bayside High School. First, I had to go through hell in a temporary assignment that was Absolutely terrible, uh, to which my husband said, good, now you know what it feels like not to love your work. That's how angry he was at me for enjoying my work, and he did not. Uh, eventually, I ended up teaching ESL in Newtown High School, and the difference between teaching ESL and teaching French, they're both foreign languages to my students. But the, the students who learned French were Americans. They had a home. They had a future. My ESL students relied on my teaching them good English to be able to have a future here. And I could give them the tools that would enable them to do that. No greater gift for my career was that of losing my job. As much as it was awful, awful, it ended up being great. My wearing a brace had a flip side also. First of all, my posture was perfect for years. Now I slouch a little more often. So pretty good. Thank you. But, you know, it was, I also learned you don't keep secrets. It was a secret I had a steel brace on. Well, those two rods in the back would make the, everything protrude. I wore cardigans in 90 degree weather. Uh, the camouflage it. All you have to do is share and say, you know, I wear a back brace. You want to feel it? That would have been it. I didn't know. I certainly didn't know, and my mother didn't know better. Um, what else? I mean, all the... All the secret of your own Judaism, you know? Right. And I love my Judaism. I, I study... I, I studied every chance I had to learn more about it. As a matter of fact, tomorrow evening, I'm going to a class... In, in the synagogue that I belong to now, uh, where the cantor is teaching about the, sa the, the Saturday services. Uh, I know the service, but I'm always anxious to learn more. And different leaders have different philosophies, different warmth. So, so to get back to the message, whatever bad happens to you, guaranteed there'll be something positive if you allow it, there'll be something positive to come out of it. Okay? Well, you've made our day. <laughs> you know, thank you so much for coming in. You're and, welcome. And sharing uh, all that wisdom and experience. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, there's a lot to be taken away from it. Um, we, uh, we're going to hand this raw footage over to our editor. He won't shorten it very much. He'll take my voice out of it, and it will create a one continuous narrative uh, and um, we're interviewing as you know because you were at that survivor breakfast and we're doing about 15 of these mm -hmm. we did three today you're the last and uh, each are just so interesting and different and, uh, yeah there's uh, there's, a lot to uh, come away with I, I, I've got are, are we still on tape yeah until uh, okay for, for very very long I did not come out. I did not consider myself a survivor. 
because I hadn't been in a camp. And there was almost an embarrassment, a shame of it. And one of the people in the group put it into nasty words that, oh, you weren't in a camp. But by then I had learned that what I went through was no picnic either. No, it wasn't a concentration camp. It was other things. Um, yeah. I, 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 forgot, a, I forgot to mention. That's a very important thought, by the way. What? Yeah. We're not comparing suffering. No. And because you suffer, you know, but right. we're not comparing whose was worse. But he, he does know, that. that, there's, that we know what that's about, you know. That has nothing to do with you. Right. I just I want to I want to add something that I forgot to say. When I lived with Aunt Polly and Uncle Nathan, Aunt Polly truly had no use for me. I understand. Her two grown children were still living at home. The daughter was frantically looking for a husband. The son was working in his room. He was an artist, and he would draw the um, the illustrations for the back cover of National Geographic and things like that. Uh, she sent me off every day with a lilting saying that fortunately I didn't understand until long after I had left there. I was there a year and a half. Goodbye, good riddance to bad rubbish. And that's what she considered me. I never ate with the family. To this day, I will not go out to eat alone in a restaurant. Can't stand that feeling of isolation. There you go, isolation. I never saw the inside of the dining room. I didn't even have the guts to, at another time of the day, just go and see what it looks like. Uh-uh. I was, I was very weak. <laughs> a lem there's a word, lemishka, which means I've made up for it. <laughs> um, so she would give me a piece of whatever meat she had made for the family, and every single night for a year and a half, she opened a little can of peas and carrots. That's what I had for dinner every night. In, in public school, one day they came along and gave us a, a little tube of Colgate toothpaste, a toothbrush, and a little sample of Life Boy soap. Oh, it smelled so awful. But I came home with it. I didn't know what a toothbrush was. I'm now, I'm now seven and a half to eight years old. Who knows what a toothbrush is? What time? and on a farm. Um, <clears throat> I showed them to her. She said, oh, okay, now you can take a bath. Huh? I didn't know what a bath was. But to her, you know, I wasn't going to be using up her soap because now I had my own little cake of stinky life boy soap. That was her outlook towards me. I understand. She didn't need a crying foreign child. It was many, many, many years later that I was put in contact with her daughter. She had been kind to me. She shared her bed with me. Um, who told me that Aunt Polly, as a girl, had lost her mother, and therefore she was placed with a mean aunt. Guess what? When you suffer as a child, and you have a chance to do the same to some other hapless little girl, you do it. I, I'm grateful to say I don't have that need. I, I'm not positive why or how I overcame it, but I know that I feel differently about it. I feel if I can make this hapless child feel better, I'll do it. So this was, and this, these were the two people I lived with for a year and a half. I didn't have to live with them that long. My mother chose to let me stay there that much longer. Uncle Nathan was a sweetie. He left at six in the morning, came home at six at night. He would have to take out the vacuum cleaner because poor Polly's back hoit. My back hoits me, so he would vacuum. Anyway, there was nothing about the experience that was warm, except in school. Miss Hoffman knew, what, six words of French? She tried them all out on me, and she smiled, and she cared, and she was so sweet to me. I learned, I understood within two weeks, and I became fluent in two months. 
because you plop somebody in an environment where nobody knows your, your native language, boy, oh boy, do you learn fast, even if it is with a heavy Brooklyn accent. Miss Hoffman, if I see her in the afterlife, I'll tell her she made a tremendous difference in my life. Because after that mean, mean French teacher, and teacher in France, I had this sweet woman who did not make me want to be a school dropout, on the contrary. And that is why I ended up continuing my studies as long as I did. <laughs>